So let's kick things off with our opening keynote. Tatiana Zambazova trained as an architect, but after 12 years working in architecture and design, she brought her passion for technology and creativity to Autodesk through her fascination with uh, exploring uh, digitization of reality. She's come to lead the development of Autodesk Memento, which helps everyone from architects to archaeologists use digitization of captured reality to express their work. And she's going to talk about how digitizing reality affects the way we create, learn, and teach. So won't you please welcome Tatiana Zambazova. Tatiana? This is the common raven. It's probably the most intelligent bird on the planet. And it's having a lot of fun lately. In it, uh, basically, the ravens are now 5x times more than they used to be. The, their population is exploding, and they started to uh, wipe out the desert tortoise. These are pictures that we're seeing a lot in California in the last decades. Nobody has recorded this predatory act. Nobody knows what to do. And they're attacking the baby tortoises. Uh, which is very sad because now, uh, in the last decades, they have attacked so much that we're down to one generation of tortoises. If we lose this generation, that's it. We don't have any more desert tortoises. So what do we do about it? We're responsible. This is happening because we live in abundance, we throw garbage, the ravens eat our garbage, and they have uh, lots of babies, and um, they eat these tortoises not because they're hungry. They're having fun. So two people, uh, called Dr. William Bowman, who is actually an uh, expert in tortoises, and Tim Schultz from Hardshell Labs, came to this ingenious idea. Their solution is to make a, a fake lure, a techno-tortoise. And the idea is to place these techno-tortoises in the desert, and then um, they will lure the ravens, and not only to record how the ravens attack, but actually to teach the ravens not to eat tortoises anymore. Teach a raven, the most intelligent bird in the planet. So how will they do it? So this is what we did. We started to digitize tortoises. Remember, the raven is the most intelligent bird on the planet. They cannot be fooled by just any kind of replica. It needs to really look and feel like a tortoise. And then we 3D print these um, fake tortoises with the idea that then uh, we put these sensor, uh, uh, pressure sensors so that when a raven attacks, it sprays out a biodegradable, not little spray, but a spray that, will, that is like a pepper spray for people. So the ravens will hate it, and then after a couple of times attacking and being sprayed, they'll probably say, I'm not going after that thing anymore. But they also want to um, create uh, robots out of these tortoises and import the camera, etc. And that's why they opened the Kickstarter campaign. I love projects like this because they exactly leverage technology trends, technology achievements that we have uh, done in the last decade, which is number one, accessible and affordable sensors. Every single camera on your phones or any camera that you can buy for a couple of hundred dollars now has a super high resolution sensor. So we can make these beautiful 3D digital replicas just out of photos. Second, we are in an age where software is not only able to do stuff, but we start to make software that really makes it easy to do stuff. The third trend is easy fabrication. Thanks to 3D printing, they can actually produce these lures. And finally, we have also easy robotics, affordable robotics. And the last thing is they tap into the crowd through the Kickstarter campaign and through the online platforms. They're able to fund these projects from the crowd. This is why I switched from architecture to technology, because I love to work with smart teams and make software and make solutions so that we can enable small players like Bill and like Tim to play a big game, to really make a change in the world. Let me tell you some other stories. A couple of years ago on a 3D print show, I met a guy standing next to a beautiful big horse sculpture. And I said, oh my god, I love horses, how did you do this? And he said, oh well, I used your 1 to 3D catch um, uh, application, take, took photos of the horse, and made this, made this sculpture with a MakerBot. I said, with MakerBot, MakerBot makes these small little plasticky ugly thingies, and this was a gorgeous, big, beautiful sculpture. So he said, oh, well, yeah, I do it with a MakerBot because that's what I have. I split it in many parts, print them out, glue them together, and then I apply these materials because I would like the sculptures to really look as beautiful as in real life. 
In the meantime, he graduated to Memento, to our professional high-end solution. And he's doing this because he loves art. And he loves to interpret the stories about where objects come from. So he's going around the museums, going around uh, places where he can find art. He captures it with um, photography and then makes these beautiful sculptures that he then uh, applies materials so that they look like bone, they look like gold, they look like bronze. And actually, they don't only look like bronze, he's... Uh, uh, reusing an old method of uh, lost wax casting, and he's doing bronze sculptures while using the 3D printout in the lost wax casting process. And he's going further than that. Um, this is a story of, uh, there was a story about what was Venus de Milo doing uh, with her arms, because they're broken, we don't know. And um, a lady, Virginia Postrel, asked to, uh, Cosmo to actually reconstruct the hands and from other artifacts found out that uh, she was spinning a thread. So he's trying to do this. Check his website. Um, they're beautiful artifacts. He's super generous. He shares every single 3D model for you to download. And museums are now interested to start looking into this and what does this mean. For me, his story is a little bit more interesting for something else he started to receive orders for life-size 3D portraitures of real people who live today. This apparently is one of the biggest venture capitalists in LA, and he ordered, or I think friends of his ordered, his uh, sculpture. So Cosmo captured his head, made um, uh, the statue, and then put his head on an antique torso, because as I always say, you men today do not exercise enough. So this for me is very interesting, because Cosmo loves art, he was using many traditional methods, but he's kind of inventing a new form of art that is enabled by technology. There is another artist, uh, he used to work with us, his name is Craig Barr. Um, he loves working with his hands. In spite of the fact that he's high-end technologist, he loves clay, he loves using his hands, which he is doing, and he started creating this creature, and then the same method, he started taking pictures, and then put those pictures in Memento to create a high-definition 3D replica of this creature that he created. And then, knowing other high-end software like Maya, he continued developing this uh, creature, uh, then uh, used Mudbox to apply details uh, just by scraping over the surface, etc. And finally, he arrives uh, uh, to an artifact that is gorgeous, that was actually not preventing him to use the traditional method of working while creating a high-definition digital model of something that he can then use in film and game, or can bring back in real life by 3D printing it. So the line between the analog and the digital world is blurring. We, we, we start with analog, we digitize it, we go back to analog, or we go further into a new digital reality. The next story is about Sly Lee from the Hydras. He is a marine biologist interested in researching corals. And in spite of the fact that the corals are super important for us, they save us from hurricanes and tsunamis, and they host biodiversity similar to the rainforest, um, there is no scientific method of how to research them. And he found, out, uh, he found that out, and then he was thinking, how can I use new tech to research if the corals are shrinking or growing, if they're healthy or not? So he found out about the new digitization methods, and uh, set up shop, he bought an underwater camera and um, uh, started capturing corals underwater. The idea for him was to create high-definition 3D replicas, 3D digital models of the corals. If you see, those are the positions of the camera, how he was uh, uh, swimming around and capturing. And he's creating these 3D digital models for a couple of reasons. Number one, he wants to... Um, um, create a digital archive of uh, the current state of the corals, but he wants to go back at the same spot, the same corals, capture them again, and then combine them and tell, tell the difference, compare them and tell the difference between the two states of the corals so he can tell if they're shrinking or growing. He was in the Maldives before El Nino, he's going again and he's comparing the two states and uh, he's the first one in the world to do that. Obviously, because the models are uh, 3D digital models now, he can 3D print them and also work on uh, researching the corals without having to take them out of the, of the ocean. Um, his site is called the Hydros, and you can go again and uh, enjoy these corals. Some of us, like me, who is scared of diving, uh, can see actually how they look like and how beautiful they are. And maybe we can get a little bit more conscious about what we do with the planet, global warming and uh, the ocean warming. 
So SLI, in my mind, is uh, developing a new type of scientific research enabled by technology. Dr. Sherry C., she is a research director at the Lawrence Hall of Science in UC Berkeley. She works with two things, with very small things, and she's researching how to educate blind kids. And um, this is a water bear. I love this thing. I don't know if you know what it is. It's a microscopic organism that lives in water. So Sherry asked um, a local sculptor to sculpt the water bear in a uh, much, much expanded size, and then we digitized it. And the idea was that we 3D printed it out of a rubbery material so that the kids can touch it and feel how it is. But this is interesting because not even we can see it. So for her, it's the value of a tactile, um, um, application of tactile experience in education is the topic that she wants to research. But this, this was very interesting to do. Um, the next story is about the famous uh, Lee Ki family. There are three generations of fossil hunters that operate in T Tanzania and Kenya. And in the last uh, six decades, they have uncovered skulls, fossils of the first humans, of the first animals, of the first tools. And in six decades, they have gathered thousands of fossils that are unfortunately dusting in the museum of Nairobi, not, where not many scientists or teachers or science aficionados go. So this was a problem for them for a long time, how to go beyond the few academic papers or National Geographic articles and how to offer this uh, wealth of knowledge that they, they have uh, created to the whole world. So Louise Leakey came to TED, and at TED we had um, a photo booth that uh, people would sit down, there were 40 cameras, to take photos of your head, and all of a sudden your head appears magically as a 3D on the screen. And Louise was like, what is that? We explained it to her and she said, oh, I have a much better use for your technology. So she went on a mission and started digitizing. This is her in a very modest environment, just a camera and a tripod, started to take photos and uh, learned the process of photogrammetry. And today with Memento, she's, creating, she's digitizing on a daily basis with a very small team, her entire collection. Um, just to show you, this is the photo, and down there is the 3D model. The difference today is almost invisible. It's really beautiful, high-quality 3D replicas. So instead of having a website where you have a picture and the text and it's boring after three minutes, uh, we helped her create an interactive site where you can either explore a, a lab, which is actually the lab in Lake Turkana. I was there in April, uh, where they uh, also dig the fossils. On this website, they can explore interactively in 3D the digitized uh, artifacts. If you're a scientist, you can research by a scientific name. Uh, you can research, is it a hominid or animal or tool? Um, there are tools to compare. Um, we are working now on a timeline. Uh, Louise uh, really wants to tell the story of the human of us, how short on the planet we are, given um, uh, how far away the Big Bang and the planet existed without us. And what does that mean to what we do to the planet today? Wiz is also sharing her models on the website. You can download them so that teachers can download the models of 3D printing or cardboard patterns uh, to make cardboard replicas like this. The idea is that at school, instead of saying, hey, open page 54 and uh, learn how different was the Neanderthal from the African guy, etc., the kids can just 3D print or make these cardboard replicas and actually compare and see how it is, have fun and learn. So yes, science can be fun because technology enables it today. So I think this can lead us to new form of education. A couple of years ago, uh, Elena Nord and uh, Sofia Hegman from the Mediterranean Museum in Sweden were tasked to build a new exhibition uh, about the Egyptian civilization. And they invited two, two technology companies to help them make something new. Uh, so Interspectral focused on touch uh, experiences and us, we were given the body of, uh, pre of um, the priest Nesvayu. And what did we do with him? Well, we first put him in an uh, MRI scanner and then we did uh, photogrammetry, uh, basically took photos of um, uh, the, the, all the, the two sarcophagi as well as the um, cartonage. And then we basically arrived to a 3D digital replica of the entire mummy and the sarcophagi. So we got the body, the cartonage, the uh, one sarcophagi, the other sarcophagi. Basically, we got a 3D digital replica of the entire thing. So what did we do with it? 
basically interspectral built this beautiful interactive table that stands in front of the glass behind which the dusting mummy is sitting in the museum. You cannot get closer, you cannot touch, you cannot explore. Here you can digitally unwrap the mummy, you can slice through it, you can see the vertebra of the mummified body, you can look into the pearls, if you know how to read hieroglyphs you can. And basically this is a real interactive experience, much better than mummy behind the glass. And because it was 3D, we were able to 3D print the uh, sarcophagus um, and assemble them as Russian babushka dolls. And uh, one thing that was interesting, when we did the CAT scan of the mummy, we found 120 hidden artifacts under the wrappings of the mummy. So because they're digitized, we could 3D print them. Actually, we printed the negative, we made the negative, and then cast it, the 3D, the, this Adler and these amulets in bronze. Needless to say, uh, the experience is amazing. I was there at the, at the opening, and I always say, usually in museums, you see the kids dragging their parents. Come on, it's boring, let's go home. This was the opposite. The parents could not get the kids out of the museum because for them, this is a game, it's a play, but they learn while playing, and that's what technology enables today. The last project is the Smithsonian. Uh, Smithsonian is the biggest collection of museums in the world. They have about 19 museums with 137 million objects. If you go to the Smithsonian Museums, this is what you see, 2% of the artifacts. There is no space, there is not enough room. So the Smithsonian wanted to solve that problem. How can they give the entire collection to those who come and those who will never make it to DC or New York? They also wanted to solve the problem of how to start becoming attractive to the 21st century kids who think that museums are boring, dusty institutions. So they learned about digitization methods, they actually heard about them, but they had to learn it on their own. They started micro-city scanning, photogrammetry, surfacer, laser scanners, touch scanners, etc. They learned on the fly, and they did something amazing. They started digitizing the collection. At that point, we met, and we decided to make something together that is an amazing project called Smithsonian X3D. It's an online tool that enables you to explore the artifacts to learn about them, an online tool that enables curators to tell the story in a 21st century way. So, we had a couple of agreements. It has to be high quality visualization in browser. No download of plugins. You go, anybody goes, anybody can see it. We didn't want the objects to look like in second life. We really wanted them to look like in real life. Then we added some tools, different visualization modes for the uh, curators, comparison, measurement, slicing, sectioning, allowing the curators to define hot, hot zones or hot spots, and then to create tours that you can actually uh, follow yourself, but um, uh, you can also interrupt at any point because they're not videos, they're interactive uh, exploratory uh, spaces. So this is one of the life masks of Abraham Lincoln. This is the tool, you can change visual modes, you can make also art artifacts with it. If you're a teacher, you can say to the students, hey, download the digital mammoth and let's check how big he was and the leg and stuff like that. Uh, we worked with a curator who had a cosmic Buddha, one in the world, and um, uh, the Buddha had this uh, relief that tells the story of the Buddha, uh, but it was so shallow and beaten up by time that uh, the curator could not really read the relief. And when we showed him that once the, the Buddha was digitized, we can not only make it look like it used to look, but we can actually deepen the relief. This was unbelievable for the curator. He said, I'm sold. This is it. Um, you can check this out as well. Just type Smithsonian X3D and you can explore it on your own. Obviously, again, because the models were in 3D, uh, the scientists and our researchers are using them to research instead of holding the original artifacts, um, but also for education. So the Smithsonian, I think, created uh, what is a sample of uh, the future of museums. The latest uh, New York Times last week actually uh, was talking about how many museums are now uh, starting to do the same and exploring their ways. So 3D digital models have a long life. All of these digital artifacts can be put in online to teach, in the classroom, can be put on augmented reality, virtual reality, Oculus Rift solutions. You can use them in games, in films. Um, but you can also create back physical replicas in the real world. So a couple of years ago, we made a product called 123D Make, which all of these cardboard patterns, uh, cardboard models are done with. We made it for kids. 
We wanted kids to be able to build puzzles on their own. The software is super smart. You put any model, either modeled or captured, and you say, I want it this big or this small, I want that thick of a cardboard or wood or acrylic, and then it slices it automatically for you. You can define the direction of slicing, but it creates automatically this uh, vector pattern that if you later decide to change the size, it will rechange it again uh, without a problem, without calculating anything. It just does it for you. And we made these uh, instruction sets uh, as well. Uh, there's six, seven techniques, different techniques of how to translate a 3D digital model into a physical artifact. This is another technique, it's interlock. Let's say this was, I was designing a, a table stand, and then you can say how many part, parts you want, but you, you get non-stop these vector patterns that you then plug in into a laser cutter, or um, um, you uh, uh, do them on paper, and then uh, you can lay them over like when you're sewing um, to cut them. So, um, we did it for kids, so I did lots of animals at that time. Um, our CEO is a designer, so he made a bench out of marble, and then we made it out of cardboard, but then we made it out of acrylic and turned out super beautiful. Then I made this little chair uh, that then I said, why not make it real size? Then I made it real size, but look at this chair. It's the same digital model, but interpreted with yet another technique in one to 3 d make. So why am I showing you all of this? Because when I went to the Smithsonian and spoke with the curator of this Noguchi sculpture that is big, heavy, expensive, and has lights that they constantly need to maintain, they were very scared and uh, they were looking at how can we make uh, something that can help us uh, uh, be less nervous about doing this. So um, a, friend, a colleague of mine and myself, we did this one-on-one -on -one crate for that sculpture using the same one to 3D make, but we just made a negative, and for $70 and in two hours, we made an exact negative for that one sculpture. This usually costs a couple of thousand dollars, has to be done from gypsum, it's heavy. Now we made this light thing that can be used for packaging, for storing, or for maintenance. So it's interesting when you make technology that um, uh, you make it for one thing, but then it turns out into something else people find use of the technology the way they want to. Um, okay, so I showed you all of these different uh, professionals uh, trying to leverage the latest tech to push their professions to the limit. They make it sound easy. Actually, when we started to work with them about two years ago, it was not easy at all. They needed five, six different software that were never done for artists or uh, scientists or researchers or archaeologists. They were done for high-end people, for engineers, for super high-end filmmakers, etc. So this is just one very generous diagram. There were many more, much more complicated diagrams that include 10 other solutions. Solutions that they need to know about, buy, get trained, uh, that are just simply too complex. The other thing that they realized very soon is that when you design something, this mouse, it can be 100 kilobytes. But when you capture that same mouse with photos or laser scans, oh, it might be, you know, one billion polygons if you want high resolution. No engine, no software in the world could handle the amount of data uh, that uh, we were generating the 3D models from capture, and we're just getting an avalanche of reality captured data from the sensors. It's just coming towards us. So we said, okay, two problems. One, usability, you know, we have to scale this process. Another one is, what do we do with these huge models? So we decided to make a new product called Autodesk Memento, and we worked with professionals who want high quality results, but have almost no CAD or computer expertise, because we wanted to make sure that they can use it. We were designing it for them, but we were listening to um, high-end filmmakers, etc., people who already use technologies like that, to learn from them what they do today and how can we make it easier. And that's what Memento is. It's all-in-one tool that covers the entire process, from input in re from reality, from photos or structured light scanners or laser scanners. It creates a high-definition 3D mesh that we then have unbelievably easy tools to clean it up, to fix it, and then optimize it and prepare it, either for digital workflows, for film, game, AR, VR, tell a story, teach with it online, or to make uh, physical replicas, CNC machines, 3D printing, etc. And then back to uh, uh, show it online, uh, to sell it online, or to create interactive experiences online. 
So the first thing that we needed to do is to create actually a new software engine that can handle this avalanche of uh, reality data that is coming towards us. We created a mesh streaming engine for those among you who are actually in this world, you will appreciate it. A mesh engine that can generate and edit and pleasurably work with two plus billion polygon data, which is unheard of. Second thing is we want to be agnostic to the input. We can digitize the analog world around us today with photos, with structured light scanners, with uh, laser scanners. The third thing is this is the software. We made it super, super clean and it will remain clean. This is one thing when people see it and say, how can it make anything meaningful if it's so simple? Well, actually, that is for me the challenge of software today. It doesn't have to be complicated to do something smart. And I believe that every software that makes you feel stupid, that prevents you instead of enables you, is not a good software. And my team and myself have focused just on making this process really fast. And we enabled I call them 3D Photoshop-like post-processing, where you can very easily clean up the environment, fix the models. Uh, we have mesh editing tools uh, to, uh, to fix some of the problems. We have some smart tools about how can you make a 2 billion polygon mesh small, but yet beautiful when you put it on Oculus Rift, etc., or 3D print, because they cannot handle these big models. There are different visual modes. When working with Slyly, we actually made this comparison feature so that you can compare two states either of the same object over time or compared to states of something designed or captured and something 3D printed to see how well was it 3D printed. We also in the software, we have a, a native 3D printing environment, which we're very proud of. And this week, actually tomorrow, a new build comes out that will be the first absolutely high resolution 3D printing in the world. Just to explain, there are many printers out there, big, small, but they all have a very, very low cap on how big polygon, number of polygons model they, they can read. Um, even a half a million dollar 3D printer, the most high end, forces me to downsize the Memento models at least a thousand times in order to print it. That's crazy. Why did I create these beautiful models if I have to downsize them so much? So we made it possible with our Autodesk Ember printer from Memento to give it directly the slices and generate up to 10 microns uh, unbelievable level of uh, quality on small scale. And 33 million mesh, polygon mesh, for example, was prepared in one minute. This is where the main value of Memento is, uh, that we can, once created the, those huge models, uh, reduce their size, decimate them, and then um, uh, bake the normal occlusion, diffuse map, displacement map, etc., etc., in order to look beautiful even when they're tiny. And by working with people like Louise Leakey, for example, she always needs to make presentations and she wanted to make these sexy videos that show how it switches from triangular mesh, wireframe to texture, etc. But she doesn't know Maya or other tools. Well, in Memento, with one click, you can make even uh, beautiful videos like this. There is also a viewer where you can publish your models online and uh, you can show them off and you can um, let others learn from that. At this point, I plan to do a live demo because every software company tells you this is super easy and then when you try it yourself, nothing works. This is the winged victory. And let me show you when I switch the visual mode to triangular mesh. I just want to show you the level of detail. You zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in to actually see the triangles. Earlier, this was possible with laser scanners. Nobody can believe that this was captured with a Sony pocket camera. This is what we are really uh, spoiled today with, an amazing, amazing technology. Just to show you, this model is 32 million polygon faces, for those of you who care about those things and uh, know what I'm talking about. But basically, this is um, the, what uh, today's technology can do. But let me not get ahead of myself and show you how do you start when you start it. So, you found an object you like, let's say it's somebody's head or a museum artifact, you place it, there are different methods of uh, digitization. At this moment, I'll show you photogrammetry. And basically, you start taking pictures all around it. Imagine you have a brush and you're basically with the photo painting, whatever you're capturing, and make sure you take photos from all around, from down, from up, zoom in if you want a level of detail. Take enough photos. Uh, there are some tricks about the photos. They have to be sharp, no shadows, no flash, no depth of field, the blurry artistic photos. We need boring photos that are sharp, 
without shadows. And um, you took them, and now you have your photos, and you say, I want to create 3D from photos. So you click here, it asks you where are your photos? Are you on your machine or on the, on the web, on, um, on some Dropbox or A360 account? You click and here are photos from Garuda, a sculpture that is in Singapore that uh, colleagues of mine have taken with um, a really uh, normal camera. So now the photos are loading and this is not the interesting thing. When the photos are loading, you have the last chance to see if your finger was in front of the camera, if a dog passed by, if some photos are blurry, we're, in, uh, we're just uh, developing features that will tell you your photos are too strong a contrast or uh, they're too blurry, they will not work out, etc. But once everything is fine, all you need to do is say create model, you give it a name, and that's pretty much it. You click start, and now, what's happening now is that the software is sending these photos to the cloud. We use the cloud to process them. Why do we use the cloud? The cloud promises two things. One is, it's fast. Uh, uh, first thing is actually, you don't need a strong machine. I don't have to have some space shuttle machine to do this, which I would have if it is uh, really um, happening on the desktop. So by that, we will scale, we will enable um, whoever wants to do this to do this. Uh, of course, we have a minimum system requirements, but they are uh, hundreds of what you would need to have in, if you really had to process it um, locally. And the second thing is speed. The cloud promises speed. Today, you're not getting the speed that you will be getting because we're not yet distributing, meaning that when we upload the photos, we still use one server on Amazon to process, but we're working on distribution where we would use 10 servers at the same time, and all of a sudden you will be getting your results in a couple of minutes. At the moment, it takes a couple of hours, you will receive an email telling you your model is ready. It will show up here with a blue dot to download, and let's say, uh, that I open what um, the email told me that is ready and I get this. And this is the first thing that people say. Your software does not work because I was taking pictures of this gorgeous sculpture and this is what I got. Well, of course you got that because actually the photos didn't know where to stop. So um, your sculpture is beautiful, it's here. It just, the photo took the environment as well. We have a crop feature that um, actually when you uh, published the photos, you can say I want auto crop. It will crop around the model, but it will still have a lot of stuff around it that needs to be cleaned. So the first thing I'll do is, okay, I want to clean up that environment. I'll just reorient. We have different methods of selection. Let's say I'll just say, I'm only interested in this thing. And now I can either invert the selection and click delete, or on right click, I'll say delete everything that was not selected. And the software, this is uh, again a couple of million polygon uh, mesh, it is super fast. So then the next thing is, well how big is this? Photogrammetry does not know how big this is. So the next thing would be to tell it how big it is. Let's say I know from here to here that it is 10 centimeters and that's what I'll do. I'll set it in the right scale. Now. Uh, some users, like Sly, puts a ruler. We also have uh, targets to download. So if you put them in a scene, we can actually calculate the scale for you automatically. But this is how you can do it as well. The next thing is, um, and by the way, I've been working on many software. How do you arrive to really complicated software is when you say, oh, let's put this and let's put this in the software. And you have to be really disciplined if you want to keep a software uh, simple. And we decided that we will only put tools that are only relevant to create high definition 3D usable models from any capture, usable for printing, for CNCing, or for uh, decimating and baking for games and stuff. So um, the first thing I always say, I ask uh, that you orient the model. Where is the sky? I'm not asking you X, Y, Z or something. Just show me where the sky is up so that when later I slice or I make videos, it's in a correct position. If it was not, you can just use this simple um, tool to reorient it. Okay. Then, almost every photogrammetry model will have a hole underneath, of course, because you're not under the earth to capture it, right? So that was the next thing that we saw that almost on every model people have to do that. So we created a tool called Slice and Fill, and if you oriented your model correctly, it will be already parallel, so you just say, oh, I want to slice, let's say, up to here, uh, and I can decide to slide the upper part or the lower part, uh, and decide, do I want to fill? Automatically, yes, because if I want to 3D print it, I cannot print a zero thickness surface with a hole underneath. 
So instead of asking you, oh, find a way to fill the hole, etc., we just do slice, clean up, and fill for you automatically. And depending on the size of the model, it might take um, uh, 20, 30 seconds, but it will do something that you didn't have to have any knowledge, and um, um, it is uh, super predictable. Uh, while this is waiting, the software works on Windows and Mac. Uh, the Mac version is actually at the moment, um, oh, I, I sliced the other part, but uh, you get the idea. So let me show you quickly a couple of more things. Uh, okay, um, let's say I was I'm proud to show you that this was my very first reconstruction that I ever did and I knew nothing about photogrammetry. Uh, my camera was Canon 100S. And I did this horse in the garden, it's Bicephalus, in a garden of a friend of mine. Um, so, let's clean up this uh, thing. So, I'll switch to the lasso mode, and I'll do this. You remember this from Photoshop or any lasso selection, okay? Um, oops. Okay, sorry, did I click delete? Yeah. And there seems to be something here, and let me just switch in. Uh, triangular mode, and let's say I would like to clean this up because I actually want to print the head, which I had somewhere here, but I don't see it now. So when I do this, you see what's happening? I've selected something else as well, and this happens very often. So we said, we'll build a tool that helps you just with that situation, which is a tool that is called Isolate, and now it's super easy for me to say, actually, I was only interested in this part. Okay, and now I'm bringing back the isolation, and super, I have a clean model that I can already 3D print. Well, yeah, I have holes here. 3D printer would not like that. But let's say I don't know about that. And I go and I say, please 3D print this. It says, well, I have to check if this is printable. So I say, okay, check, and um, it's checking for inverted normals, zero thickness surfaces, double meshes, spikes, tunnels. 3D printers don't like many things that you don't need to know about. We did not want to expose all of that geeky talk to scientists and researchers. It tells me, okay, it cannot print. I say, why? Can you show me? It says, well, you have one hole, another hole, a third hole, no good. And now I can ask the software to fix it itself, or I can do it myself. This is something that we call swim, snorkel, dive as a concept in the software, where we want the same software to enable those who don't know much to swim and hey, I want to do this, I want to do this, and the software does it for you. Or snorkel a little bit if you want to tweak some parameters. Or for those who are experts and know what they're looking for, they can dive, we give them deep, deep controls. So in this case, I'll say, you know what, I want you to swim. I mean, I want the software to fix this. And I'll say fix all holes. Now, of course, the software will do the best that it can, but will it do it perfectly? Maybe not. Well, it did a good job, but uh, maybe I'm not very happy with these edges here. So for that, we have another tool, which is a kind of um, a sculpting tool that will just enable you, you know, depending on where your mistake was, to just a little bit brush it up and fix it, okay? And then, let's say we're ready to print. Now we fixed it. Uh, we can skip the checks or check it again. It loads the 3D print utility that has many different uh, printers. Uh, it shows you the bed of the printer. It can help you understand how big can you print within that printer, reorient easily. And uh, this is what I was telling you, uh, layer thickness down to 10 microns for the ember, meaning I don't have to make this model smaller in number of polygons to print it. So you don't need any different software. You just um, do it all in one software. For those who are high-end professionals, just to show you, if I wanted to export this model from 1.200,000 uh, 200, polygons, I can decimate it easily to something much smaller, but if I click on rebake textures, it enables me to rebake the displacement normal and occlusion map, which means, translated for you who don't understand, that if I put it on Oculus Rift and it has to be 300 polygons, it will still look as beautiful as you see it here and not as origami because it has not only limited number of polygons. There are many, many smart tools uh, to show you. I'll just uh, show one more, two more actually, and then I will wrap up. Let's say there was a hole here. And let me just switch this. 
We now have a, a tool that is super smart. The moment you approach yourself to a hole, it will recognize the hole. You select it and then just fill the hole. We also have a bridge tool that enables you, very often people, uh, when they t capture uh, heads, be it of statues of real people, they forget to take enough photos from the top. Uh, so let me show you an example. Um, when you forget to take photos, you get something like this, that is not very pretty. Um, we do two things. Either we interpolate and we will have a um, confidence map, a slider that will show you this was inserted by the software and this was what you really captured. So if you don't want the inserts, uh, you, will not be, you will not do them. So let's say, let me get rid of that um, horrible thing here. And just to show you another smart tool, so let's say this is something you did. You simply forgot to take enough pictures, okay? So how do we fix this? We have this really smart tool, again, specific just for this situation. And um, I will just make the, uh, oops, the brush smaller. And what I'll do is I'll select uh, one triangle here and one triangle here and say I would like to build a bridge. So the software has a way to build a bridge that is smooth and understands the curvature between the polygons that you captured and then makes that, or uh, flat if that is what you wanted. And uh, now I can, using the smart tool or just by, um, by uh, using selection, go around the whole, oops, sorry. I have an edge here on the podium that is very difficult for the mouse. <laughs> and then again, save, fill, hole, and fix problems like this. Um, another thing, I mentioned it's super easy to make uh, really smart videos. Uh, we can make automatic uh, turntables, and you can preview them if it is exactly what you wanted. Or we can make a video like I showed you at the beginning uh, that switches from one visual mode to another, and uh, you can control the camera with a couple of clicks without knowing any keyframe animations or any uh, stuff like that. For that, we'll switch to keyframes, and we will say, okay, this is my first frame, make a keyframe. Then I switch to this mode, make a keyframe. Then I want to see it from this side, but in this mode, make a keyframe, etc., etc. You click export, and that's it you created a phenomenal video. Um, this obviously um, can be applied, this method, and it doesn't matter if it's from laser scans, from photos, or from structured light scanners. This can be applied on any scale. We have beautiful drone captures with GoPro that result in a, uh, in a building. This one actually is um, a very special case that is a combination with a laser scan and photogrammetry. Actually, point, uh, laser scan and photos combined together in one digital model without reprojecting or anything. It is a unique technology that we work on and that we're very proud of that you will soon see uh, come out. Laser scanners are precise. Uh, they make sharp edges, etc. Photogrammetry gives you gorgeous textures. Combined, they make for the best result. This loads a little bit because it's a huge model, um, but um, you will get the idea of the quality and I just wanted to show you something else that is not um, just an, um, so you can see, this is the level of quality that you will be getting. So, this um, concept of having a dig analog world, being able to digitize it and then bring it back into the real world, we call it rip, fix, burn. And then the other one, what we saw with Louise, with Smithsonian, is rip, fix, learn. And we really believe that this will impact the way we teach, we learn, we design in the future. I see artists and designers in the future being the originator of the master files, where they show them on their website, this is what I designed, you can buy my product, or you can uh, buy the IP for my uh, design, and then you change it the way you want it, and maybe you changed it, and now you have many more followers than me, and people prefer your design, and they buy it, so I hope that we can make some kind of a digital DNA that will track down, for financial and social reputation reasons, the originator, of the master designs of the master replicas. I will wrap up with this and I want to leave you with a video that we shot last month for a conference called The Future of Storytelling that peeks a little bit in the future of what will this bring. And with that. 
between what's analog and what's digital is starting to merge. Our physical world is so unimaginably rich in texture and in depth, but until very recently our digital experiences for the most part have been limited to flat 2D impressions of reality. Today innovative technologies like 3D printing, WebGL, virtual reality and augmented reality are all redefining the ways we can experience and recreate the world around us. So what do all of these revolutionary technologies have in common? They all require high-quality 3D digital models. What does it take to make a 3D digital model? You can create a model from scratch, geometrically constructing it by extruding and revolving with nerves, meshes, splines and solids. It's a laborious process requiring complex software and high-end knowledge. Alternatively, you can capture the analog world as it exists. This can be achieved with specialized 3D scanners, but this type of hardware is prohibitively expensive and also requires immense technical expertise. Every day, technology is becoming more accessible and easier to use, but the difficulty of generating high-quality 3D assets has kept this trend out of the world of 3D. Until now. A new process called photogrammetry utilizes state-of-the-art algorithms to convert regular 2D photos directly into 3D data. With smart sensors that are now ubiquitous, a new software that is exceptionally easy to use, anyone with access to a modern smartphone or a camera can now capture and create a high-quality, ready-to-use 3D digital model. What stories can be told when we can all digitize the world around us? For artists, being able to easily capture, modify, and recreate physical assets opens up a universe of possibilities. When we can sculpt any object, environment, or living thing, the entire world becomes clay in our hands. For marine biologists, it's helping them better understand the world's ever-changing oceans. For the first time ever, using photogrammetry, Scientists can measure coral reef systems with astonishing accuracy. Not only does this enable us to document the state of existing corals, but with repeated scanning, we can actually observe ecological changes as they happen over time. The Buddhas of Bamiyan in Afghanistan were glorious statues carved into a massive cliff over a thousand years ago. In 2001, they were destroyed forever when they were dynamited in an act of religious extremism. Like so many times in our history, an invaluable piece of human heritage had been lost. Except this time, we decided to search for the lost statues in a place that previously nobody would have ever thought to look. The web. Between Facebook, Flickr and Google Images, there are thousands of photos of the Bamiyan Buddhas taken by tourists through the decades and from almost every possible angle. Using photogrammetry and hundreds of these crowdsourced images, a team was able to digitally reconstruct the Bamiyan Buddhas in a gloriously detailed 3D replica, one which now celebrates the story of humanity, of all of us together preserving a vital legacy for future generations. In the near future, we will be able to digitize our entire planet as it exists in every moment. This four-dimensional impression of our world will enable future generations to literally scroll back and see what was really going on in this particular part of the world at that time. We'll digitize ourselves as well, giving our great-great-grandchildren the chance to see us the way we were when we were their age. By being able to better document our achievements, as well as our mistakes, we will help new generations build a future for themselves that we can't even imagine. Some stories are simply too big to be told by one person or one group of people. From passive listeners to active participants, 
we all have the power to take initiative in this frontier of democratized capture and creation. We're able to connect dots differently, to find deeper meanings in the patterns that emerge, and consequently, we're able to begin asking better questions. These new stories can be experienced differently in all parallel ways, across time, across geography, across cultures. And most importantly, these stories will mean so much more to us because we were part of their creation in the first place.